thank you very much. Um, uh, because I'm the first speaker of the day, I um, uh, thought I'd begin uh, by asking everybody to join me to, uh, to thank the wonderful organizers of this terrific com co conference one more time. It's really been extraordinary. <laughs> I'm very excited to present at a conference like this one, not only because of the, um, uh, the beautiful venues, but um, uh, most importantly because of who's here including um, really the forefathers of the field as well as people who are doing the most recent uh, excellent work in this area. So I feel very lucky to be here and to present uh, an early version of the paper to get feedback from comments, uh, like commenters like you. Let me say in that respect that I'm going to be a lot shorter than the other presenters. Um, I'm going to wrap Everybody up reasonably. Says that. <laughs> <laughs> I am trying to make a credible commitment in this respect because um, far better for me that I get comments from you. We haven't submitted the paper yet, um, so I'd much rather um, get Ehud's uh, comments and yours. Um, uh, so I'll try to be quick. Oh, one more thing. I um, uh, recently was nominated to be a commissioner of the Securities and Exchange Commission, and their lawyers tell me that I'm supposed to say that everything that follows is my views only and not the views of anybody at the commission. Uh, that's especially true. Yourself. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I don't really understand this because they're my views and I'm going to work, but anyway, uh, 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 they never agree with me anyway. So really, I have zero influence, uh, but uh, I'm supposed to say that. Okay, the paper is Activist Directors and Agency Costs. What happens when activists go on the board? There's a tremendous amount of recent related work, including um, uh, by Alon Brav and his co-authors. I'll talk about that. And by uh, Jill Fish, as he mentioned yesterday. It's co-authored work with my Columbia colleagues, Jack Coffey, Josh Mitz, and uh, Robert Bishop. And um, uh, uh, I'll try to quickly summarize it for you. Uh, what we try to do here is explain one effect of settlement agreements between activist shareholders uh, and uh, target boards of directors and its effect on the market in the company's securities. More on which in a moment. Let me give you uh, a little background. Uh, so first, there's obviously uh, a great deal of work on activism more generally. Um, there's, of course, the foundational work from, uh, from Alone and his co-authors in 2008 in the JF explaining uh, the effects of activist interventions. Um, there's recent debate, however, about the degree to which activist interventions actually add value or instead um, cause other kinds of deleterious things. Uh, that's a favorite theme of my old boss, uh, Marty Lipton. Uh, in light of those discussions, policymakers right now are focused on changes to securities law in this area. Marty's firm has petitioned the SEC to make changes to those rules. Alone, Lucian and I have said that that would be a mistake. Um, uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a, a central debate right now uh, in securities law. One interesting thing about that is that most activist interventions don't end these days in a proxy fight or a, a forced merger acquisition. No, no, they end with a settlement agreement. And uh, uh, alone, Lucian uh, Wei Zhang and their co-author um, uh, have recently explained that in a, in a working paper. Uh, another recent working paper has explained this too. You can see that activist interventions in general don't end in proxy fights, they end in peace settlement agreement between the uh, board and the uh, activist. And here we try to contribute to that work. We build on prior evidence. We extend the data set of settlements that um, uh, we have all the way to 2015. That's important because the time trend shows that these have become even more common recently. We review each by hand. We code them for certain characteristics of the settlement. And then we try to show you what their effect might be for the market uh, of the, uh, of the, in the company's securities. Whenever I present a paper like this, I, start, I like to start with what I was looking at. I can show you just the kinds of agreements that we were reviewing, and this is one. Um, between a hedge fund you might know, Third Point, uh, a big player in this space, and a company you might know, um, uh, Dow Chemical, um, they had an activist intervention a few years ago, and they entered into this settlement um, uh, with respect to it, and this settlement is reasonably typical of what we have in the underlying database. Uh, two things happen. First, the, act, the board agrees to put the activist nominees on the board. Typically, as a loans paper in this area already has shown, there's one of two types of directors who are appointed, either like an industry expert that the activist wants to put on the board for reasons of expertise, etc., or one of the hedge fund's own employees. There's reasonable heterogeneity in the sample, actually. Sometimes it's one of each that get put on the board, but that's what the board agrees to do. We put your nominee on the board of directors. 
We'll also make changes to the bylaws to expand the board as necessary to accommodate your friends on the board. What the board gets in exchange is peace. The activist agrees um, to uh, not uh, solicit proxies in a proxy fight. They agree, this is kind of cool and I think so far unnoticed, they agree to vote with management anytime there's a shareholder proposal brought before the, uh, before the company. They agree not to bring a proposal on any matter themselves. And um, uh, the board gets what they want, which is peace with the activist, uh, although they get a couple of new friends on the board. We code uh, more than 500 of these entered into between target boards and um, activists uh, between 2000 and 2015, and we code it for who gets appointed to the board, um, uh, whether the, what kind of activists we're looking at, whether it's a hedge fund or some other kind of shareholder, and other characteristics of the agreement, including, importantly, the following. Whether the agreement includes a provision governing the sharing of information. I want to say, just as a spoiler alert, that that turns out to be important uh, with respect to determinants of various outcomes. And also, I think it's interesting because a loans paper in this area makes this really interesting um, and important point about the degree to which there can be complete contracting between the shareholder and the target. And we want to explore the extent to which they can actually contract over some of these things. This is a point that Jill raised yesterday, too. Um, we then do the following. Knowing now who's on the board and the activist that's attacked and appointed uh, the directors to the board, we look at the firm's revelation of information to the stock market. They do that, of course, typically through what's known as Form 8K, uh, the current reports requirement of uh, the 34 Act. Basically, something material happens to the firm, and they're required to disclose it in an 8K. We extract more than 600,000 8Ks filed by more than 700,000 uh, public companies uh, throughout uh, our sample period. And then we merge the two samples to see how the presence of an activist director on the board affects the revelation of information by the firm. So far so good? Yeah, okay. So let's just start, I always like to start with summary stats, with what we see uh, at a summary level in the agreements. Uh, first, and by the way, this is very consistent with um, um, uh, uh, Lucian and Alone's paper, we, we show that the, on average the, um, uh, the, the activist acquires between one and two board seats closer to two. We actually find one interesting thing, and I'm not sure if this is in your sample, although I'd love to hear about it. Sometimes the activist doesn't actually take a board seat. Instead they enter into what's called an observer agreement, where they get to hang out in the boardroom without actually occupying the seat, more on which in a minute. Um, Sometimes the, um, uh, the new director group includes an actual employee of the activist hedge fund, as opposed to an industry expert. And they also frequently call for reimbursement of the activist's expenses. Um, this is what they look like at a summary level. <clears throat> and let me just start with basic work we did to understand what's going on in these agreements. The first thing we did, as really anybody should do, um, is just confirm the famous um, Brav Zhang Partnoy Thomas result from 2008, just to be sure that um, we see a positive cumulative abnormal returns upon the filing of the 13D, the typical announcement effect, which we do. We, we confirm that in the paper at similar magnitudes as in uh, that piece. Then we confirm, um, uh, as in the uh, Alone's paper on settlements, that the announcement of the settlement is associated with positive cumulative abnormal returns. So, that's interesting because it suggests anyway that the market reacts positively to the revelation that the activists and the board have uh, arrived at uh, peace. But there's interesting heterogeneity in the sample in that result. And again, I'm just introducing the result here. There's nothing causal yet. Just showing you what we see on cars. First, the average five-day cumulative normal return is a great deal higher for settlements that involve appointments of directors who are not employees of the hedge fund, but instead are industry experts, the other typical type of director. We see that the cars are much higher. That's not to say that there aren't positive cumulative normal returns when it's just a hedge fund employee. There still are. I'm just talking about magnitudes first. Second, this is kind of interesting. The average cumulative abnormal return is much higher for a settlement that has an explicit rule about information sharing in the agreement. 
typically binding the activist directors to a confidentiality agreement or to some rules with respect to how the information they learn in the boardroom can be shared with others. We find that the cars are much higher in cases where the, this has been explicitly contracted for as opposed to when it's not. Okay, so um, what we want to do, what we're trying to do in the paper is measure how the presence of these directors affects the way that information gets its way into stock prices. And to do this, we build on a recent paper um, with um, uh, my co-author um, Wei Zhang and, and Josh Mitz, um, where we look at what we call leakage. We try to figure out the amount of information impounded into stock prices for each 8K at a particular point in time. This is what it looks like mathematically, but let me try to first explain it intuitively. You can imagine there's some value of the share before information is revealed. Yeah? Then you can imagine the 8K disclosure is filed. And then let's just assume for purposes of this hypothetical that the equilibrium stock price after that information is revealed is here. What we're interested in is the slope. How does the stock price travel from here to there? You can imagine uh, an unrealistic but potential scenario, which is that it looks like this. That is, the market doesn't know what's happening uh, in the value of the shares until the disclosure is filed, and then it jumps immediately to the equilibrium price. A more realistic possibility might look like this. That is, the degree to which information is slowly making its way into the stock price. And we use this measure. We basically establish a ratio between the price changes that we see in the four days before the disclosure and the price day in the five, the price change in the five days that include the day of disclosure. And we establish that as the ratio of what we call leakage, the degree to which information is making its way into stock prices. And that's what we measure on the left hand side for most of our specifications here. Good? Great. Okay. Yeah. I'm so glad you asked. That's a really good question, Marco. I want to be clear about something. The information revelation we're referring to is not the settlement agreement itself. No, no. It is the revelation of material corporate information following the entry into the settlement agreement. These are disclosures of mergers, uh, share buybacks, um, changes to the executives, etc. That all make sense? So when is the settlement agreement filed? The settlement agreement is typically filed long before that period. Does that make sense? The cumulative of normal returns I showed you in, the, in this slide actually relate to the entry of the settlement agreement. But what we're looking at is the information environment in the stock after the settlement agreement when this activist guy is on the board. It's an important distinction. Make sense? OK, good. All right, so having kept that in mind, um, we try the following design. And the degree to which you like this paper depends on whether you agree with this design. I think it's debatable. We can talk about it in the Q&A. So what we do is uh, a, differences and differences, a difference in differences set up where we uh, have a treatment group that, in con that, control, that includes firms that have an activist director on the board and a control group of uh, public companies, some specifications we match, others we just use all public companies that don't have an activist director on their board. In separate specifications, we use as the control group not all public companies, but instead companies that have been the subject of a hedge fund attack, but have not had directors on the board. Now, obviously, in any DID, to the degree you'll believe it, depends on uh, parallel trends before and after the event. And I'm going to show you uh, some detail on that. I want to say that in the paper, um, and maybe who will talk a little bit about this, we show balance tests in the pre and post with respect to the treatment and control that show very few relevant differences with respect to variables of interest. But to me, if I were you, I'd want to see a picture. I'd want to see trends. And this is what it looks like. We uh, identify the event day zero at, uh, as the day on which the activist either gets observer rights to hang out in the boardroom or actually gets the seat that would give them um, uh, information. And we look at um, uh, settlement firms, which are in the red here, and control firms. In this specification, the control is all public companies and their 8Ks, although again, in other specifications, we use uh, hedge fund targets. Um, and we get a very similar result. And what you can see here is a very significant, leakage is on the left-hand side, a very significant jump around the time the activist acquires the board seat in the leakage rate of information outside the boardroom. Now, 
One, a few interesting things about the result. First, it's decreasing in time. So we see it in the first couple of hundred days, in eight days that follow entry into the uh, activist settlement agreement, but it disappears over time. You can speculate for the reason for that. I'll talk more about it uh, in a bit. One reason would be that to the degree people view what's happening or the trading underlying this as in some way legally risky, they might engage in some and then dynamically reduce the activity over time. Another possibility is that the most relevant um, disclosures that occur after an activist intervention occur in the 100 or 200 days immediately following the activist uh, placement on the board. But I want to say in response to that possibility, and I understand if that's what's entered your mind, that we do check and balance tests for the subject matter of the disclosure, for the frequency of disclosure, for the nature of disclosure, and we don't see any difference pre and post in treatment and control. So I understand the intuition that what might be going on here is that activists are re revealing more information about the firm, but that can't explain this. It could be something else, but it can't be that. Uh, let me say... Oh, here. So um, this trend, it's smooth, so this trend actually isn't as meaningful as it looks like. But what you're seeing, you're saying, why does the settlement, why do the settlement firms have less leakage before the, um, uh, before the event date? It's not statistically meaningful. Um, but uh, uh, basically, we, what we do is, I'll, I'll cheat and show you some balance tests that I have in the, whoop, that I have in the appendix. Oh. <laughs> Boy, that's a good move if you don't have a good answer, huh? <laughs> I have a button here that's like, if Jill asks a hard question, just press it and <laughs> everything goes away. So, uh, so Jill, let me show you. So these are the um, balance tests, pre and post, for the various different uh, disclosures. And one thing you'd worry about is um, that the, that the uh, target firms are engaging in different disclosures before the event date than they are after. So we test that here. Uh, we do find something that's interesting. Um, uh, the, uh, and I, it's here. So we look for the number of news articles about the company pre and post. And we do find, not in like a standard news search, but we did a Factiva search by hand to see like sort of financially relevant information that traders might pay attention to. And we see that the firm grows a little more quiet following, um, uh, 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 following an, act, uh, an activist intervention, that is treatment by post after the, um, that is after the settlement date. Um, the firm gets a little less noisy with respect to, um, with respect to disclosures. The reason I don't think that's a problem for the broader conclusions in the paper is that remember this is a ratio. So remember, in the, just keep in your mind that we have in the denominator the total amount of information that's coming out of the firm in the four or five days before the 8K is filed. And in the numerator, we just have the four days or the three days before the 8K is filed, the, the date that doesn't include the 8K date. So it can't be that what's happening is that a different total quantum of information is coming out in the activist firm. Because if so, the ratio would adjust accordingly. That is, it's not that more information is happening. Is that Given uh, the quantity of information in the denominator, we see more leakage in the numerator. That's not an answer to your question, but, uh, and I'm still thinking about what might be going on in the trends, but the one thing I'll say about what you see there is that it's not, meaning, it's not statistically uh, significant. One thing you might be wa wondering about, like a gut reaction I had when we first saw the result, is hey, after an activist, after an activist attack, it's got to be that the firm gets n newsier, like more stuff happens, because the activist has gotten in. They've demanded operational changes. They're shaking things up. Or maybe they just like to talk to the press and you get more news. So we test that in the control group and the treatment group um, uh, throughout uh, the filings. And we show there's no, these are all 8Ks over time in both groups. There's, they're statistically indistinguishable. There's a very similar rate of news coming out of these firms. So again, while I understand that might be an intuitive explanation, it can explain uh, the results I've shown you so far. OK. So we know, OK. So we know that firms are leakier after an activist uh, gets on the board. Now I'm interested in exploring some heterogeneity 
Like I told you, lots of the settlement agreements have different characteristics. Sometimes there's an activist hedge fund employee who gets on the board. Sometimes it's an industry expert. Sometimes there's an information sharing set of provisions in the agreement. Sometimes there's not. And I'm wondering which of those might be driving the result that we see. The first thing I want to say is that it's very clear that the settlements that include an activist hedge fund employee on the board are driving the leakage. That is, we separate the, the sample into uh, uh, agreements where an, empl an employee of the hedge fund is actually getting on the board and those where they're not. And we only see the statistically meaningful result in treatment by post in cases where the uh, hedge fund's actual employee makes their way onto the board. So first, uh, the results being driven by those cases. Second, the results also being driven by agreements that have no provisions regarding information sharing. So we, um, once we got this result, we went back to the agreements, recoded them as to whether they have a provision addressing what directors can or should do about information they receive in connection with the board. And we see that um, agreements that have no provision addressing information sharing drive the leakage result. Um, uh, that is, we only see that result in cases um, where there's no information sharing rule in the agreement. So a couple things about these results. First, I know what you're all thinking now, which is, oh, that's cool. is, there, is this insider trading? And the, let me just be very clear about this. I have no idea, and neither do you. And the reason is that this, uh, I haven't shown you a mechanism for the result. I've shown you that the firm gets leakier, right? But I haven't shown you a single trade. I haven't shown you data as to who is trading, or when they're trading, or how they're trading. You might suggest I go look in Form 4, because directors have to file a Form 4 under Section 16 when they trade in the company's stock. Or maybe you'll tell me to go look because hedge funds that cross 10% become Section 16 filers. I did. I don't see anything. And that doesn't surprise me, because if anyone's doing it and they have a decent lawyer, they're not going to file a Form 4 being like, hi, I'm Pershing Square. Send me to jail. Also, um, I, I want to be clear, the law around insider trading here is absolutely ambiguous and requires things like breaches of fiduciary duty and other things that I haven't said anything about. So it's not, I haven't shown anything along those lines whatsoever. What I've shown you, and it should not be astonishing with all respect, is that hedge funds get into the boardroom and the company becomes a little leakier. Um, and that's just a point about the information environment of the firm rather than a point about insider trading. Here's something else you might be thinking. I sure was. Look, when people are trading on the basis of information, market makers necessarily respond to that. Yeah? It's not like they sit around. I mean, Slava's shown this like nine different ways. It's not like they sit around and are like, oh, great, take advantage of me in the bid-ask spread. No. What they do is they widen the bid-ask spread in response to this stuff. So you should force me to show you a widened bid-ask spread result, because otherwise, Something is way wrong with what I'm doing here. And indeed, I can show you um, a significantly widened bid ask spread result. But here is a significant weakness of the paper. Look at what happens to the bid ask result over time. Look at, I told you the leakage goes away in a couple hundred days, but the bid ask spread result does not. Now, I have all kinds of possible explanations for this. I can do like my little tap dance, you know. Empiricist tap dance, I can say like, look, there's literature that suggests it takes time for market makers to narrow, the, and Slava has said this, it takes time for market makers to narrow the spread. Uh, it, uh, uh, it could be that we're, something in the specification isn't picking up the narrowing of the spread. But look, at the end of the day, I'm telling you, it's a puzzle. We have a, a really significant, powerful result on widened bid ask spreads in the firms that get these activist directors, and it doesn't narrow over time. Uh, and I'm happy to talk more. I'd like to understand this puzzle better, but I'm happy to talk more about it. You're right, Bernie. Actually, I think I can give you the number of days at which it becomes statistically meaningful. It's something like 160. But you're right, it doesn't jump at the event date. That's right, Bernie. OK, so um, quickly to summarize, because I'd like to get more comments. Um, so first of all, uh, these settlements deserve further study. I'm glad that other papers are emerging in the space, because they're really um, the most common result. It's a contractual result that's been understudied, and it's very interesting about what, what kinds of things a shareholder and a director can and can't contract for. I worry, having read the literature in this space for a while, that at the table in this negotiation are directors and activists, and as usual, other shareholders are not. So I'm interested to know whether there's some possibility that their interests are not being uh, adequately represented in those negotiations. That's not unlike uh, settlement context we've seen before, like shareholder lit settlements. Um, 
This definitely deserves more study, not only empirically, as Alone has already done, but also theoretically, like what the nature of that collaboration might be, whether it's productive or not, what the rules of that game should be. This is really something we haven't studied as much as we should. Also, to the degree that people are worried about this, I have to tell you, it is interesting to me that these agreements get entered into to put uh, activists on the board, and the agreements themselves aren't subject to shareholder ratification. That's something that people might take a look at. Now, you might argue, actually they are ratified by shareholders, because later those directors come up for election on the corporate board. So in a way, they're ratified. But see, that requires you to believe in the vigor of corporate elections, and come on. I'm not so sure that that's the same as ratification. Oh, finally. That was your personal opinion. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Last thing, and then I'll shut up. Uh, I think um, to the degree that we think that what's happening here is some benefits are being captured by the activists through leakage of the firm's information, and I'm not suggesting exactly how, but if we think those benefits exist, that could be a subsidy to socially valuable activism. So I've said nothing at all about welfare enhancement or not. I'm not, I'm not in that game today. What I will say is that um, to the degree we're concerned about whether in fact it's welfare enhancing, giving shareholders the chance to ratify might be helpful. Why? Because they might be able to tell the difference between activist interventions and settlements that are actually enhancing in value and those that are not. So that's the paper. Looking forward as always to a Hoots comments. Okay, so, um, so this was a, a, a real pleasure to read this paper and this is my first slide. Yeah, so, um, so the paper is really two papers. There is a, even three. There is an empirical paper first. There, there is a, an addendum, a long addendum of a, a theory piece. And then there is even a formal model, which I didn't get to read in, in the end. Uh, so I, I probably you can make two papers out of it. Um, all right, so I will divide my uh, thoughts to the empirics and then to the theory part, which you didn't really get too much in this presentation, but I'll talk about it anyway. Uh, so just to summarize the results, uh, two main results. There is leakage that increases after appointing a director to the uh, board of uh, directors of the target firms. And you find more of the, you know, this more le leakage is associated with hedge funds in particular. And when the uh, director appointed is an employee of that uh, hedge fund, and when there is, I call it confidentiality agreement, but it's whatever, it's just agreement not to divulge information, something to keep information. Uh, and then this effect wanes uh, in the long haul. Uh, and then bid ask spread pretty much follows the same pattern. Uh, there isn't a regression on whether this is associated with the activist being a hedge fund, but I assume you can probably find that result as well. Then there is uh, a result that's on the, also only mentioned in the abstract about the market reaction, about the cars. You addressed that here. I didn't see tables. But the market seems to be happy with uh, not having an employee director appointed and, 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 yes, having some confidentiality agreement. So these are the results. So the first, I guess, kind of Jill and you yourself, uh, Rob, stealed my, uh, stole my, uh, my, my thunder because First thing, I don't understand why, you know, I don't know how I can make of the, you know, how much I can make of this uh, uh, diagram, but anyway, that why should the leakage be lower before the uh, intervention, before the appointment, before the settlement is announced, than in the um, uh, control group of firms? And why should it kind of be on a decline at all? If anything is going on there, it, that it cannot be associated with the new directors that are appointed. It's maybe something that's related to the firm or to the incumbent directors. I'll get to that point a little bit later. And then uh, the leakage you know, kind of jumps and then, as you say, gradually uh, disappears. And, and then uh, the question is why it should disappear. And, you give in the paper one explanation that maybe the detection risk uh, increases. I would have thought the opposite, that the, you know, everybody's focused on this company and insider trading exactly when something dramatic happens. And you know, two years later, who cares about this uh, hedge fund and the director? So I would expect uh, the risk of detection to increase over time. 
And as you say, you don't even know that this insider trading or leakage or whatever is illegal at all. So why, if it's to the extent it's not illegal, why should anyone, anyone care about detection? One thing you could do is to see when these activists sell and when the director resigns and see if you can associate changes with that. Uh, okay, so this is the main result, you know, without the T statistics and so on. And what we see here is that the treat, again, the same thing, there's the treatment firms, the ones that get the settlements, they start with less e leakage and then they kind of catch up uh, uh, after the director appointment. You may want to see the combination, you know, the linear co uh, combination of the treatment and the treatment post to see, you know, I, I think it's going to be significant anyway, but uh, you can't just focus on the treatment times, the, the interaction term. You have to put the, the addition, the add them both, I think. Now, uh, a note on the definition of the, by the way, all my headings are at the bottom. It's kind of upside down. So a note on the definition of the treatment group. So the dummy variable that, in, that, that uh, identifies the treatment group, it's a, non, it's a, it's a time invariant one. It's whether this firm was, uh, had a settlement or not. It doesn't identify the point in time when you actually enter the settlement. And to the extent that there is a time, and I think this point came, came up a little bit during your presentation, when there is a, if there is a time lag between the announcement of the settlement and the actual entry of the director on board, you may want to have two dummies, one for each point in time. So you can actually see that the leakage is associated not with the announcement of the settlement itself, but rather with the entry to the board, which is what you would like to see. Um, all right, so, oh, <laughs> yeah. All right, so just, you know, you find uh, uh, the effect only in subgroups of those activist uh, targets. And you may want to verify that this is not just an artifact of the smaller number of observations that have these features, that they have uh, non-employees uh, non on board and that they have non-hedge funds activists, that, that, there is, that there is a confidentiality agreement. Maybe this is driving the difference between those subgroups. Um, now, this is something that you said yourself. Uh, it's not clear, and it is a puzzle why the bid ask spread continues to increase over time, over years, like we see here, three years, uh, and uh, uh, the director appointment and the leakage actually goes in the other way. So, if there are two associated phenomena, you would expect them both to be, uh, you know, uh, the connection between them to be mon monotonous and not to change in the middle. Um, all right, some just additional thoughts, suggestions for you for the empirics. You may want to try to find determinants of placing employees on the board. Maybe it's something that has to do with the hedge fund identity. Some hedge funds like it. Maybe some firm characteristics. Uh, and does this predict the outcome of activism campaign? If it does, this could independently perhaps explain your findings. So we really, what the, you're seeing is the type of activistic campaign rather than the presence of an employee on board. Um, you look at all eight Ks indiscriminately. You may want to focus on the ones that carry more punch, that have more information, and see if the effect is there. Because to the extent that, that this leakage is illegal, it will be illegal only if it's material information. And that's what you will see in the big uh, the eight case that really move prices. Uh, and, okay, there's just a, I'm, I wasn't sure about some interaction a, a term, if it, it has to be there or not. So I'll forget about that. That's for you more than for the audience. Okay, comments on the theory. So <clears throat> at the end, to, uh, I'll try to do quickly. So at the end, you say probably the employees are not the ones <clears throat> that, um, um, leaking the information, and you didn't say it, but I would assume not also the hedge fund employer, the actual activist. You can try. You said that you did. You didn't find any, that they make any abnormal returns on their investment. Uh, if this is something you looked at, then forget about this comment. Uh, then you say that it's probably the other hedge funds uh, that, are, uh, uh, make, that, that are getting all these tips. 
And again, maybe to the extent that you actually see other hedge funds in the same firm, you may try to see if they actually make more money than everybody else. But there is a, 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 a question on why the hedge fund would tip them off or the employee would tip them off in the first place. First, you say uh, uh, the reason why you tip them off is to keep them on board, kind of reciprocate. They help you, you help them. First, they still make money from mergers after the activist entered the board. So maybe you don't need to incentivize them to stay there. But if you do need them, then that might be uh, a, a cost of having the activist campaign in the first place because you really need them to be credible, to make a credible threat so anyone at the company would negotiate and settle with you and let you put a person on board. So you need these guys and maybe this is you know, the cost of hedge fund activism. If it's not, then it's not clear, if you don't really need them, it's not clear why the hedge fund activist would bother to divulge information freely to the public, to a bunch of people who don't really help him, and along the way cut his uh, profit from, from this uh, campaign. So you're really being generous to other people. Uh, all right. One thing I would not rule out is that the actual incumbent directors are the ones who are trading more uh, you know, before the 8Ks. And this is, remember that we saw some movement in the leakage before the settlement. So maybe you wanna look at what they do. And uh, do we really need to do anything about this? So uh, first, and the paper proposes a couple of suggestions how to limit this activity. So some are legal, some are market solutions. So first, if we really need this as part of the, you know, uh, uh, what did I call it, the, uh, the ecosystem of hedge fund activism, uh, then you really, uh, you don't want to fight it at all. I mean, you, you don't want to, this is some, something that is necessary. It's like a, uh, a, you know, a, a germ that really helps the body do something positive. On the other hand, if it is excessive, if it really is not worth the candle, then uh, why not just have the, head, the institutional investors uh, deal with it themselves? You say that you, they need to vote on the settlement agreement, but they can even earlier just not support the activist. Your data covers the year 2015, but it seems from what you write that the institutionals are getting annoyed more recently with the hedge funds. So if really they keep getting annoyed, they will stop back them and the hedge funds will really not be able to do much without their support. So that's it. But again, a great paper. And uh, I think you, it will even develop more. Thank you very much. All right, a few of the experts in the Correct. Perhaps all the changes the bid spread are due to the all the changes in the bid spread are due to changes in the volume of trading. Bid spread is really sensitive to the volume of trading. So at the beginning you see a low bid spread after the intervention of treatment because there's a lot of trading. And then it settles down and it does reverts to low trading levels. The main determinant of the dusk is, is uh, trading volume. And the second comment I want to tell you, uh, to ask, uh, do you have information of how many events, 8Ks and so, happen after the treatment, after they change, uh, they introduce uh, this uh, new director? Perhaps there are more, more uh, more uh, events like that. And this is important because if there are more events, like, uh, more announcements, it pays for all those who seek information, uh, dig for information to invest more effort. So there are more leakage just because it pays for outside people to try to dig more information related to your film, if there are more news after this uh, kind of event. Okay? So thank you very much, and thanks to Ehud. Would you like to come and collect
few more sure. people. There are many comments. I think Bernie. So there is a microphone floating yeah. around. Yeah. 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 So there are things I like a lot about the research design and things that I want to push on. Um, one thing I want to push on is I don't think your control group should be all non-targeted firms. You've got to match on whatever you can match on. Um, I'm certainly concerned about the non-parallel trends in the pretreatment period. And don't tell me they're not significant. I can see them, right? Um, and that's often the case when, when I do these leads and legs graphs, and I love to do them. You can see something with your eyes that no individual data point is significant, but nevertheless, uh, there's something there, and better matching might do something about it. The second is, in effect, you have several treatment groups. Or you say you have several treatment groups. You have hedge fund employee on the board. You have someone else on the board. And then you have the tweak of uh, an information agreement or not, which I suspect is only relevant if there's a hedge fund employee on the board. Because if it's an outsider, there's probably there's no, no obvious channel. But what, I, what I'd urge you to do is run the leads and lags graphs both for your leakage measure and for your bid-ass measure, comparing the different groups, right? See, see, not, not, just, not just the regression yep. coefficient, but, but see what the graphs look like for the different subgroups. Um, and you're right, the difference between the bid-ass spread and the leakage measure is a puzzle, but you, you might be able to get some traction on that. If first, if you match some of the, it may go away, but then if you look at the different subgroups and see if you're getting consistent uh, results. I want to ask, I want to get all the questions, but can I just ask Bernie a quick question about that? So, um, we had a bunch of different control groups. We, we've done this a bunch of different ways. We did a match sample to a law firm. We did a match sample to hedge fund targets. We've done a bunch. The critique we keep getting when we do, like, for example, hedge fund targets that are not, you know, is, look, those hedge fund targets that don't result in a, in a settlement are unique in their own way. They're not a meaningful control group. Now, I personally, my own, this is like some politics among co-authors on this question, but like, let me just say, like, I, do, would you be more persuaded by that, Bernie? I would start by matching on financial variables, and if you worry that the recent financial variables are impacted by leakage about the hedge fund being interested, go back six months. But okay. match on size, match on growth, match on market cap, match on share price returns, match on R&D, match on capital expenditures, match on 20 different financial variables and get a comparable set <coughs> of firms regardless of whether they're targeted or not. That, that's how I would think about cool. that. We'll do. Hello, uh, okay, so you have, yeah. you have quite a few. Oh, Hannes and then Slava and then Marco. Okay, okay. So, oh, so maybe so, And Alon Bravo, of course. <laughs> to, uh, uh, to, to cap it off. To, to follow up on, on, on Bernie's point. So first, as you know, in an event study, right, it's very hard to identify who is trading and why. So it's very different from identifying the abnormal return from then figuring out why that is happening. That's just challenging, but that's built into the paper. To, to follow up on the control group, what I think might be also useful to match on financials, but then these are firms that may be different in the sense that you know there is information leakage overall. Why? Because there has been recent ball turnover. So I think one additional control group that I would definitely want to look at is you know what about firms that haven't been targeted by the activists, but they have recently experienced ball turnover. So there are new guys, and you know information is getting into the market potentially because of that. It has nothing to do with the activists, but everything to do with more information. You know. Yeah, I've got a few questions, suggestions. The first one is, it, it's you or the lawyer in the room, but we I mean, call someone, we, we, we call them the leakage. I think it would be great to somehow support it, uh, direct evidence. And I know it's very hard, but an alternative name for that is price efficiency. Right? Sure, it's I a matter of that information, and it's uh, in many models, people would say it's very out. Right? So I know that you kind of, Take or you don't want to make the statements, but it's good or bad. But one way to address it is to think about how much attention other market participants are paying to these firms. Do you see any changes in coverage? Do you see any changes in ownership structure? Do you see that other funds, like in the own paper, come and start investing in these firms? That it, it could be a potential on explanation. One way to think about more directly about insider trading is to maybe split your sample based on whether the news is good or bad, because there are some asymmetries in the type of trading regulation based on whether you buy shares or sell shares, <coughs> you can give a nice identification. 
And then the last comment is that it, it, it would be really interesting to consider board members that join companies in proxy fights, because their dynamics can be very different. These people actually may leak information strategically to influence what, what, to influence what is happening. So you can just take cases when there is a proxy contest and someone really wins it, and then see what the dynamics of information are different. Two, three. Yeah, well, I have a similar uh, comment on the use of the word leakage, because you measure it through AK. Now, we work with Thomas and Julian, and we very much focus on activist outcomes, which are um, things that get disclosed to the market after the activist is in. Now, if you would redefine your AKs as saying, uh, these are actually, uh, you know, the abnormal returns you get from them are actually the information value of the AK after an activist is present, you could argue that well, what you're measuring is uh, activists who have an agreed presence on the board that leads to more outcomes, and therefore the outcomes that are announced through the AK that right are more valuable. That would be quite a different interpretation of the rule of leakage. Just to be clear, that can't be, because we do pre and post balance tests on the frequency of filings, and we see the exact same content, we see the exact same. It, that, it, I mean, when I say that can't be, that, that's wrong. I mean, there's no evidence <laughs> to the effect that it's not. Okay, last comment along. <coughs> you have a mic. One quick question, because of the fascinating results. So, question and sort of more of a comment, uh, but just to calibrate. So if you look at the, even sort of assuming that the matching is, is not one, so there were like 0.6 or 0.5 on the metric. So can you just give me a sense of calibrating so the average announcement return is X? You know, what's what's the leakage? What's the matter? What are we talking about in terms of how much return presumably, right? So it looked like 0.6 was 0.5 times the, the announcement return. What is it? Just to get a sense of the quantity. Sure. And the other thing, so uh, Robin and I have a paper where we were looking, so we discussed this um, on the bus. Uh, so Robin and I have a paper where, where we look at um, uh, when activists cross the 5% threshold and we, we show that there's this big turnover that was sort of unexplained and immediately the, the rush was, well, maybe they're telling their friends who trade on top of their trade, right? <coughs> and uh, I don't know, uh, Salva, if you were, so, so Marco Di Maggio, America Money, I think two other colleagues, I forget their names, uh, have actually a couple papers that look at leakage that tends to happen through the prime broker that is executing the trades. And so even to the extent that it's not the story Salva was saying, you have a sense of can we go after that uh, and find whether it's sort of it's really the, you know, the guys on the other side were kind of intentionally or not spreading out the news. So just a question. All right. You're quite a bit. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, look, so uh, this is why this comments are worth uh, coming around the uh, That This is extremely helpful. Just very briefly respond. Um, uh, first, along, uh, I can't do the magnitudes off the top of my head. Let me just say the reason why is it's like all thousands of AKs, which are it's very, there's a lot of heterogeneity in terms of uh, uh, what's being announced. Um, this is why Ehud is right that we should present separately, we run this separately but present separately the big news AKs versus the smaller ones, and then I can give you a better sense of magnitude. I don't think it's trivial, but that's subject to interpretation. But I think offline, I think that, that's math I can do. Slav, I think you're right. This could be viewed as more price efficiency. Uh, and this is why we're careful, and I tried to be careful this morning, in not making big welfare claims about this. It could just be that the firms are, there's more price efficiency in news with respect to these firms. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I will say, that when it comes to insider trading, that argument was rejected by dumb lawyers. Now, I just want to point out that, you know, uh, it, it was rejected. That doesn't mean it should be. I, look, I'm one of the dumb lawyers, that, but I wasn't there, it wasn't my call. But still, I'm, I'm saying the idea that it's price discovery runs into this sort of legal limitation. The issue about bid ask spreads and volume, um, so here's the thing with this design. Any issue that we try to think of, we try to raise would have to be an issue that happens at the same moment that activist gets on the board. Because that's our post date, right? That's the date in the middle of these charts. And it was a good comment, but we were pretty careful. Post in the coding is the moment the activist either gets access to information through a observer agreement or gets on the board. So it'd have to be a story where volume is spiking, not at the 13D announcement, 
which is plausible and, in fact, true. But instead, the day the guy gets on the board, that would have to be the spike. I don't think that, I mean, it's possible, but I don't think that's what's going on. Now, Bernie's right, of course, that we have to match better on the control. But I think we can agree that if the result persists, I mean, Slava will call it better information price discovery. Lawyers will call it something else. And that's like standard, but I think the result, we, to tell a story about uh, that, that uh, we have to have something fundamentally that is timed at the same moment of the board entry to confound the design. Now, we could have that, but it's not good what we do. These are all uh, extremely helpful comments, so thanks so much. Thank you very much. Great start to the